Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to University United Methodist Church. We are glad you are here and we are glad you are worshiping with us. We do have a couple of announcements, I'll be honest, probably best served after church and during the end, but I'm afraid I'm going to forget. So I'm just going to let you know now. If you ordered a poinsettia or poinsettia and have not yet taken one home, please do so today. If you didn't order one and still want to take one home, please do so today. Um, if you do have cats, don't take them home. They are poisonous to cats. Somebody asked, well, can people eat them? I don't know. I would not try, but um, cats are attracted to them, and they, are, they don't do well. So if you would, to please take a flower home. Um, if you got one, great. If you didn't, our gift to you, that would be wonderful. Also, during our anthem, Alex Price will be leading the choir, and we wanted to let you know that. Um, so that is something that's very special and we're looking forward to. Um, with that said, God is here and God is present. So let us open up our hearts, our minds, our souls, and experience God that is in our midst as Ken plays the prelude. able to join in the call to worship. As we come into the new year, so much is before us. We have decisions and choices, resolutions and discernments, but we want to stay with the Christ child in the nativity. We want to kneel with the shepherd. We want to live the adoration. But God calls us into a new year with new journeys and new adventures. God calls us to discipleship. So let us lift our hearts in song as we come to worship.
please be seated as we join together in the opening prayer, the Wesleyan Covenant. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt, rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside by thee, or exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty, let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield to all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine, and I am thine. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. Now, after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, 
and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken to the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the Magi. Then what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled, he will be called a Nazarene. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. I love Christmas. It's my favorite holiday. In fact, I wish we could always celebrate Christmas. People just seem to be nicer around that time of year. I, I'm one of these people who love those Christmas villages, particularly the ones that are up all year and you can go in in July. I get it. It's kind of odd. It's 110 out, and yet it's Christmas. And we are doing that here. We are continuing with Christmas. Uh, officially, the season of Christmas ended on January 6th, but I wasn't ready to let it go. I love Christmas. I wish I could stay within the pageantry of the nativity. I love it. The shepherds, the wise men, all there looking at the baby. I love it. And yet... It's not real. That's not how it was. You see, we, we love to put the two Gospels together to create our story of the nativity. All of our nativity scenes combine, well, I shouldn't say all, most, combine the two Gospels. So we have shepherd and magi there at the same time. But they're very different. In fact, Mark doesn't even have the story. Mark begins at the baptism John begins in the beginning with a hymn, in the beginning there was, and then picks up at the baptism. It is only Matthew and Luke that have the story of the nativity, and, and they're both very different, and, and they both wrestle with how is it that we fulfill prophecy by having the child being born in Bethlehem when Jesus was a Nazarene? from Nazareth. Luke does it by having him being from Nazareth. There is a census, and so the family must travel to Bethlehem, and there he is born and travels back. Matthew does it in a different way. In Matthew, Mary and Joseph are from Bethlehem, give birth to the child, the Magi come with adoration and leave by another way, and then we enter into our scripture today. And before we dive into our scripture today, I think we need to go back even further, back into what we know as the Old Testament or the First Testament, into Genesis and Exodus. Because you see, when I read this scripture what struck me was Joseph's faithfulness. 
Joseph's willingness to say, okay, let's go. I, I don't even want to go. I want to keep Christmas. I want to keep that time. And, and Joseph and Mary just had a newborn child, or worse yet, a two-year-old. <laughs> you think moving with a child is hard? Try moving with a two-year-old. Any of those who had children know it's called the terrible twos for a reason. And Joseph is, God comes to Joseph in a dream and there's no argument. There's no negotiation. There's a simply, okay, let's go. And I got to tell you, I admire that. I wish I could live into it. I don't. Usually when God comes to me, there's argument and negotiation and give and take, and you think after all these years I would learn, I never win, but I don't. But anyway, I think we need to go back further. As I said, we, we need to go back to two people, Abram and Sarai. You may know of Abram and Sarai. They were desert people. God came to them and said, you will be the parents of a great nation. And I am calling you to move. Move from where you are to a new place. And Abram and Sarai struggled. They asked, how can we move? For God is with us here. We don't know if God will be with us in the new place. You see, back then it was believed that gods were territorial and gods were tied to the land. And I say gods because it was believed there were many gods. And if you were of a place when you moved, your god stayed there and you were to adopt the god of the new place. And, and they wondered, well, how can our god ask us to move? Isn't that essentially abandoning our god? And, and they found something amazing. They found that when they moved, not only did their God move with them, but their God was there before them and always was. God was not tied to them, but God was in all places at all times. God was present. And so they built an altar wherever they went so they would remember to worship God because God was present wherever they were. And this experience was life-changing and transformational, transformational for Abram and Sarai. It was so life-changing that their names changed to the people you may know better as Abraham and Sarah. And they had a son, Isaac. Isaac grew and married Rachel and found the same thing wherever he and she went. God was present. Isaac and Rachel then had a son, had two sons, Esau and Jacob. And Jacob grew and married first Leah, and then Rachel or Rebecca. I can't remember, I'll admit, I get the R's mixed up. <laughs> Mom and daughter-in-law. Um, then he married. And they had 12 sons. The 12 tribes of Israel. And you, if you know the story, you know that Jacob was always on the move. And Jacob also realized that wherever he went, God was present. And he had a life-changing experience. He wrestled with God, as you may remember. And suddenly Jacob changes his name to Israel. And as I said, they had 12 children. They actually had 13. You may remember the littlest. He had a fancy coat. He had a dream. He kind of he was kind of a little snot, to be honest. 
who kind of gave it to his brothers. His brothers had had enough of him, decided they were going to kill him because, well, that's what you did in that day if you didn't get along with your brother or sister. Whew. And then they had a change of heart. They decided, nah, let's not kill the kid. Let's just sell him into slavery. At least we'll get a couple bucks. This is the Stephen version, not the biblical version. <laughs> it's a little bit... So let's get a couple bucks. They sold him. He went down into Egypt. You may remember he grew up. He becomes quite well known. And then back in Israel, there is a famine. And so the 12 tribes go to their brother, unbeknown, asking for food. And historically what happens is those 12 tribes, because of a famine, because of food insecurities, they move, they migrate. And Israel migrates down into Egypt. Time goes on. Those who once were refugees and migrants become slaves. And then there is a child, another child who is born, Moses. You may remember him. And there is a decree by the Pharaoh that all the children shall be killed, firstborn male. And so Moses is put in a basket, literally sent down the river, no pun intended, and is received by one of the queens or the princesses and of Egypt. He grows up. He grows up in Egyptian royalty, has a few problems, kills a person, and then ends up being a shepherd, has this encounter with God in a burning bush, and goes to Pharaoh and says, it is time for my people to leave. We're not staying in Egypt. Takes the people through the Red Sea into the desert for a time of testing and finally into the promised land. This is a story of trust. It is a story of faith. And ultimately, it is a story of freedom and liberation. And now we get to Matthew. Joseph taking his family down into Egypt for a time. We're not told how long coming back. Not to the place they were originally from, but to Nazareth. We then, if we were to continue on, would have the story of water and baptism. A time of testing in the desert. So you see the parallel. We are told that this child is going to be about liberation. This child is going to be about freedom. But there must be movement. We cannot stay where we are. And I got to tell you, I think about that and I'm like, why? I, I love the nativity. I wish I could stay in its warmth, in its comfort, in its tradition, and rest in it. I could literally have every sermon I ever give about Christmas. I'm okay with that. You may get a little bored, I'll admit it, <laughs> but I'm okay with it. And then this scripture speaks to me and says, we cannot stay at the nativity. We cannot stay in that place of comfort for God calls to us just as God calls to us, just as God calls to Joseph and says, it is time to move. And I don't know if I have the faith that Joseph had. I don't know if I have that trust. And yet, as I go back and read the story, as I read the history, God is always about movement. God is never about staying where we are. God is always about movement. We see that in the story of Abram to Abraham, Sarah to Sarai, Isaac and his wife that begins with an R, <laughs> Jacob and his wife that begins with an R. They are always in movement. They are always in transformation. 
God is always moving before us. And I got to admit, I kind of wonder, like Abram, if I move, will God be there? And I need to be reminded that God is always present. God is there, in fact, before I even get there. God has prepared that place. And so we are called to continue moving. We continue to move through the prophets. And, and you have Isaiah saying, you will move. Figure out what must be left behind. For I am doing a new thing. God is constantly doing a new thing. There is constantly change. And, and if you're like me, I'm like, no, no, I, I want it to stay the same. But the one thing I know is constant is change. I see it in my own life. My daughters get older. I, I really do want them to stay young. I, I want that Christmas where we open presents together and they're young and yet, they grow old. My parents grow old, pass away. I want them to stay young and vital. And yet, there is always change. There is always movement. And it is always good. God is always moving us forward. And I got to admit, I want to stay in Christmas, but I can't. For it's the new year. It's a time for change. It's a time for movement. It's a time for transformation. And, and i got to be honest, I, I don't know what this new year will bring. I know for the church, it will be a time of change. It will be a time of movement. And yet I also know as we move forward, God is present. God is there, and God is with us. I don't know what's going on in your life. Heck, I barely know what's going on in mine. But I know as we move into the new year, there will be change. There will be movement. There will be transformation. And there will be discipleship. I'm also going to say that there will be heartache. There will be loss. There will be death. There will also be new life. And in all of that, God is with us. And I think maybe that's the point. Maybe that is the point of this Matthew story. That no matter where we go, Bethlehem, Egypt, Nazareth, God is with us. Amen? Amen? But yet I do want to stay in Christmas. I really do. I, I love it. I, I love Christmas. I, I don't want these decorations to go away, but rest assured, next week, they'll be gone. Sometimes it's good to put away. It's good to leave things behind. It's good to pack up and put away, it's good for you all to take the poinsettias. <laughs> but I want to stay in Christmas. So today, instead of ending in a prayer, I am going to read you a poem. It's by Henry Van Dyke, and it's called Keeping Christmas. Henry Van Dyke was an American writer. I will tell you, it is... It is of its time, and I'm not going to change the language, where he says, men, I would like to change to all people. I'm not going to, but please know that women, you are included. <laughs> is there anything better than the observation of Christmas Day? Yes, there is. What is better than Christmas is keeping Christmas. Are you willing to keep Christmas? Are you willing to forget what you have done for other people and remember what other people have done for you? To ignore what the world owes you and think what you owe the world. To put your rights in the background, your duties in the middle distance, and your chance to do a little more than your duty in the foreground. To see that your fellow men are just as real as you are. 
to try to look behind their faces and into their hearts, hungry for joy, to own that probably the only good reason for your existence is not what you are going to get out of life, but what you are going to give to life, to close your book of complaints against the management of the universe and look around you for a place where you can sow a few seeds of happiness. Are you willing to do these things even for a day? Then you can keep Christmas. Are you willing to stoop down and consider the needs and the desires of little children? To remember the weakness and loneliness of people who are growing old? To stop asking yourself how much your friends love you and ask whether you love them enough. To bear in mind that other people have to bear in their hearts things of tragedy. To try to understand that those who live in the same house with you, what do they really want without waiting for them to tell you? To trim your lamp so that it'll give off more light and less smoke. And to carry it in front of you so that your shadow will fall behind you to make a grave for your ugly thoughts and a garden for your kindly feelings with the gate wide open. Are you willing to do these things even for a day? Then you can keep Christmas. Are you willing to believe that love is the strongest thing in the world? Stronger than hate, stronger than evil, stronger than death. And that the blessed life which began in Bethlehem 1900 years ago is the image and brightness of the eternal love, then you can keep Christmas. And if you can keep it for a day, why not always? But you can never, ever keep it alone. Let us pray. God, we come together knowing that you have called us. You are there with us, behind us, beside us, and before us, in us, above us, and below us. You are ever-present. You call us to a life of change and a life of transformation, and yet we admit we like things to stay the same. We like things that are comfortable. We don't always want to step out in faith. And yet as we look to Joseph, one who had the faith, the courage, and the trust to follow where you led. God, may by your Spirit that faith be in us. This is our hope and our prayer as we go into the new year, that we will follow you, just as your Son asked those disciples, will you follow me? Let our answer be yes. And let that answer come not only with our mouths, but with our hands, our feet, our hearts, and our entire being. God, this is our hope and our covenant for you in the new year. As we come together praying the prayer that Jesus prayed, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I do want to say thank you. Thank you to you. For you... Us, we are generous. And it's not just at this holiday time of year, but I know it is throughout the entire year. But I do want to share with you that during Christmas time, we took up some special offerings. We collected a bunch, that's an official number, a bunch of baby stuff. We were able to take it to the African Community Center. They were thrilled. The parents were overjoyed, particularly with diapers. It's funny what a little thing can make, but we also know that diapers are very expensive. 
and so they were thrilled to get those. Through your generosity, we were also able to give them a $3,000 check, which will go to help new mothers, mothers who have come from different places for the betterment of their family, either through immigration or refugee status. We were, al we will al we were also able to give $3,000 to Hope for the Hopeless so that they may take in more children in Ethiopia. And that is all due to your generosity. And I simply want to say thank you. You are making a difference. We are making a difference. Here in our community and globally, we understand that we are called. We are called to go out into the world. We are called to change the world. We are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And we do that in, the, in a variety of ways. One way we do it is through the giving of God's tithe, our gifts, and our offerings. So I simply want to say thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your caring. If the ushers would come forward, now is a time for the giving of God's tithes and offerings. And the finding of the plates. Gracious God, give us the courage to follow you wherever you may lead. Take our gift, our offerings as symbols of our devotion and trust in you. Bless them and us 
so that others may come to know of your love and grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> As you go forth into the new year, go forth knowing that God goes before you. Go forth to keep Christmas. Go forth to be the hands and feet of Christ. And know that the God of love goes with you. Amen. <laughs>